Well, um, how many of you are thankful for some of the warmer weather that's been kicking in? Yeah, yeah, I know some of you are getting kicked around by allergies right now. I understand. I, I thought it was something emotional that I said, but then I'm realizing it's allergies. It's, it's allergies. Um, yeah, with the warmer weather upon us, I, you know, it, it really brings me back to that time as, um, as kids where, you know, you'd end up going outside for like countless hours playing all sorts of games with your friends. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? You could relate you know, to some of that time of year. It could have been in the city even, or in the country, or like me, right here in the suburbs, right around here. You know, you're doing that, and um, you just look for games to play that you, know, you could just get together. Um, you don't need any you know, electronics. You don't need any wires. You don't need any batteries. You don't even need any sports equipment. Just like it's just you and your friends and that's it and you're just going to play some games together. Uh, who can name for me, name for me some games that kids play together that don't require any of those items. No sports equipment, no batteries, no wires. What's that? Tag. All right, good. Tag. Yep. Hide and seek. What else? Tag. Yep. Kick the can I heard. Is that... Tic, uh, tic tac. How do you play tic tac toe without? Uh, no, you need chalk though. I think you need. Uh, yeah. Ju no, you need a jump rope for that to play jump rope. That's why they call it jump rope. Simon says. Yeah, Simon says. Bill, that's two. He's, he's on a roll here. Oh, relay. Red light, green light. Red light, green light. One, two, three. What was the other one? Giant steps. Okay, now we're dating ourselves, Janice. Giant steps. Giant steps. Yeah. Um, uh, also, right, you can also play, well, if it's just two of you, you can play patty cake, right? I'm sorry, I didn't play a lot of it, but I just know, you know, no, I didn't, I didn't. Um, how about follow the leader, cops and robbers, right? Things like that, and yeah, but you guys got to like, yeah, uh, who can tell me um, what game this is? I know, some of you thought it was run away from the kid who's crying next to the tree. <laughs> Right, because this is a lot of times what we try to do. What? How are you? Oh no, 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 too mo too emotional. I'm out of here. You know, uh, no, you were, you got it because somebody said it before. Is one of the first ones. Hide and seek. Yep. You know, yeah. If there's one game that kids still love to play, listen, I had about six teenage boys at my house last night, and the thing that they still wanted to play was hide and seek, hide and seek, like in the house. And I'm like. My wife and I are like, no, it's not happening. We've lost shower doors because boys have decided to play hide and seek. Closets have fallen apart, you know? The bigger they get, then it just becomes harder and harder. And you know about hide and seek in case you don't. Again, it's like, you know, one person is chosen and then they have to count and everybody else goes hiding and then they go and try to find them and that's, that's hide and seek. And then whoever they find first, then that's the person who becomes the seeker next time. Um, not all kids, though, are really that good at this game. Especially when they're young. They're, they, they're not quite thinking. Like, take this little guy, for instance. <laughs> you know, remember, just because you can't see them doesn't mean they can't see you, right? Or uh, how about this, this guy, for instance? Yeah, I, it's just, yeah, yeah, that's a good one there. Um, I, I love this one because the one child's like, you've got a great idea. I'm with you, you know? And you see kids do this, right? When they're little, especially. Um, oh, yeah. No. Now, this little guy had the right idea. He really had the right idea. You got to give him props. Little did he know that the container, you, well, you, you got it, yeah. But he had the right idea. You got to give him an E for effort. That. And then this little guy pulls the classic one. It's the <laughs> hiding behind the pole, you know? It's just... It's a classic. We've all done it at some point as kids, or we've seen kids, you know, just if I can, yeah. People used to make fun of me because I'm so thin. You know, like, John, you could hide behind a telephone pole, you know? Or, you know, used to say, you know, John could be holding a stack of Bibles on a rainy day, and the wind would still blow them away, you know? That's, yeah, I got it. Now, if, if you've ever played the game, you know how it goes, because a lot of these games like this, tag, hide and seek, first all the kids are together and like, let's play hide and seek, and before you know it, all of a sudden, like, just coming out of the mouth, not it, not it, not it, not it, right? Everybody says, not it, not it. And then the last one who did not say, not it, they're it, they're it, right? They're it, and then the child starts, you know, okay, go ahead, you know, one, Two, three, four, right? And then when they get to whatever number they've determined, then the next line is, before they go, is what? What do they say? 
Say it again. Ready or not. That's right. Ready or not. Here I come. Now, if you're a little bit, you know, tricky there and you want to keep it on the down low, you're sort of like, ready or not, here I come. Right? Because you want to like, it's the element of surprise. You don't want them to know you're coming, you know? Ready or not. Ready or not. Folks, if there's anything that Jesus made clear, it's that one day when he returns for his bride, the church, the church, made up, by the way, just let's clarify, made up of both Jews and Gentiles from all nations, tribes, and languages that have trusted in the King, in the Lamb, in Jesus. That when he returns, there will be those who will be ready for him and those who are not. Those who are not. Today I want to talk with you about ready or not. Ready or not. While speaking about that day uh, of his coming, Jesus said in Matthew 25, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Can you read verse 13 together with me? Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Let's pause and pray once again. Father, we just thank you for your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just continue to do a work here today, giving us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to believe and receive your word. I declare my dependence upon your anointing, Holy Spirit, for myself and each one in the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I want you to notice a few things from our text today as we talk about ready or not. Being ready for Jesus coming. Being ready for eternity. Being ready to meet Jesus. Firstly, notice in our passage, number one, that there's a desire for the bridegroom. Can you say that together with me? There's a desire for the bridegroom. So interesting, Kivian, that today you were talking about that and in, in, in between songs and just this idea of like a desire for God. I thought, she didn't know my notes for today, you know? She didn't know that, this, this desire. Now, let's face it. When it comes to weddings, we're not used to really in our culture, I say our culture, we're such a mix and plethora of cultures here, but in, in, in American culture, for instance, that we're not used to making a big deal about the groom, <laughs> right? That's not the way it goes. Um, I hate to admit it, but the groom is often what I would call the supporting actor for the leading lady, <laughs> right? Namely, the bride. The bride, she's the one that everyone makes a big deal of. She's the one who's maybe even dreamed about this day for her whole life. She's the one that just gets so, you know, beautified and all dressed up in a way that just, you know, uh, you know she's just spent hours. I mean, I've done weddings where I've watched the guy like even minutes before getting ready for the ceremony. You know, this, this is what happens. You know, and we sing, right? We, we know the traditional song, here comes the groom. No, here comes the what? The here comes the bride. Like, here she comes. This is what we think of, right? This is, this is, you know, she's the one, and everybody knows that. But in Jesus' time and culture, the groom, the groom was seen as anything other than chopped liver. 
In fact, his arrival, the groom's arrival, was marked with great anticipation, with great joy, with, as all part of the festivities and ceremonies that were taking place. This is why even when we look earlier in the scriptures in John's gospel, John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way for Jesus, says these words, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Now, what's John doing here? Well, we know he's doing the same thing that Jesus does as well. John is drawing from imagery that was familiar to the people of his day. How those like the friend of the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom would be this trusted individual of the groom who would handle all sorts of parts of the, of the wedding and, and the festivities and everything. The friend of the, bride, the bridegroom, he, he had a lot to do. And, and so for this friend of the bridegroom now to, to hear the voice of the, of the groom, the bridegroom coming, maybe in this processional or, or maybe in the, in the time of the ceremony. Th this brings him great joy, John says. Now what John was really talking about was Jesus, the bridegroom's arrival on the scene of Israel in his day. There and then, first century, you know, Israel. John was talking about Jesus the bridegroom's arrival there in Israel. John was saying it brought him great joy to know that Jesus had come because it wasn't about John. No, he was just the friend of the bridegroom. No, this was instead all about Jesus, the bridegroom. The bridegroom. Now, Follow with me. Now, Jesus picks up on the same imagery in Matthew 25 in our passage, but here it's not about the same coming that John is referring to. Our passage in Matthew 25 is about Jesus' future coming. Jesus' return. I love it because I was talking to a young man right here in the parking lot, you know, even this past week. And, and again, we, we both could agree, I said to him, that we know that true peace will come when Mashiach comes, when Messiah comes. We both know that. We're both looking forward to, and we're both anticipating this coming of Messiah. We know, we know as the scriptures unfold, that he has come, but he's coming again. He's coming again. Again, he has come, but he's coming again. What oftentimes was seen by, by the prophets, I would just say as it was likened to for me many, many, many years ago, oftentimes the prophets were looking at what would be like two mountains in the distance. And as you're looking at these two mountains in a great distance, they look so close to each other. Have you ever done that? Where you see them far away, you're like, wow, they look so close. But here's the problem. When you come to the first mountain you recognize how far away the second mountain really is. Folks, this is what we see unfolding in the Hebrew Scriptures as the prophets were talking about things and seeing things about the coming of this son of David, of this Messiah. They saw things as if they were like two mountains together. But now we recognize Jesus came firstly as that Isaiah 53 suffering servant. The one who would pay the price for his people's sins. But he will also come one day to reign as the son of David. Who will come and bring true peace to this world. That many all around us in our community are still waiting for. They're saying when Messiah really comes, he will bring that peace that the scriptures speak of. And we're like, yes, he will. Yes, he will. But that's the second mountain. That's the rest of the story. The rest of the story. News Radio 88 fan, some of you know exactly who I'm talking about. Now let me say, let me say, this whole idea of a groom returning, a bridegroom coming back for a bride, totally fits in with what we know of how Jewish weddings took place in Jesus' day. Namely, that there was a period of time between the betrothal this, this, this legal you know, bond now between not only the, 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 the woman and the man, but also between their families, this legal agreement 
between them, that period of time between that betrothal and the final wedding ceremony and consummation of the marriage where the couple comes together. There was a period of time between them, uh, probably, uh, again, about a year, about a year's time. This is the period, by the way, that Mary and Joseph, anybody ever hear of Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, right? Mary and Joseph were in the midst of, according to the Gospels, when Mary got the good news, <laughs> a little frightening and a little disturbing in a lot of ways, the good news that she was now going to be with child, the son of God. Holy cow, what are you talking about? I'm already betrothed to this guy. This was a big deal. This wasn't some sort of like flippant like, Oh, you know, um, we just got engaged. We took a few pictures and that's it. No, this was a major family event. Things were exchanged. You know, people were giving payments and, and this was a time, this was serious. That's why it says when Joseph found out that Mary was expecting, he decided to do what? To divorce her or put her away quietly. This would have been like the righteous thing to do. Why? Because they were already legally bound to one another. They just hadn't yet consummated the marriage. This is what was going on. So this period of be between this time of betrothal and the rest of the wedding and the consummation of the marriage, th this was definitely something in existence. And so Jesus is speaking about this. It would have been during this time in between the betrothal and the wedding that the groom would have been building a place. Did you hear me? In between this time of betrothal and the consummation of this marriage, it would have been a time where the groom was now building a place for he and his bride to live in. Anybody making some connections? Making some connections. And oftentimes what was happening was the groom would begin to build onto his, you want to take a guess which uh, character in the family? His father's house. Again, archaeology and excavations and etc. has now uncovered that we know for years now that there's this thing called the first century insula. It would have been a courtyard in the, in the midst there of first century Israel and other places. And around that courtyard, the family would have been building homes. And they would have continued to extend these homes and the living quarters as the family grew. So there's a central courtyard, and then around it, they would build, oh, so-and-so got married, oh, time to add on to it. Oh, so-and-so just got married, time to add on to it. So the family would continue. Now, I don't know if I like that idea when I think about my boys someday. But it was the way of life. Again, hear me, in between this time of betrothal and the coming for his bride, the groom would be preparing a house, preparing a place in his father's house for his bride. Now think of John's words in chapter 14. Jesus says this. Can you read it together with me? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Wow! Wow, once you and I are clued in a little bit more to the historical, right, cultural context, by the way, a key, a key thing to do, you know, when you're talking about understanding the Bible, right? Once we know that and we see Jesus' words, we're like, wow, that's like right out of their everyday lives. Now it makes sense. Like now I know because the groom would do this for his bride and then he would come back for her. He would come back. Talk about that moment that the bride looks forward to with great anticipation and expectation and joy. That moment where the bride, groom, comes and takes his bride and takes her into his father's house. His father's house. Aren't you looking forward to that day? Aren't you looking forward? And Jesus in Matthew 25 
drawing from the wedding customs of the day, paints this picture of the bridegroom's arrival being announced by a loud proclamation. This cry that rings out, the bridegroom has come. He's here. He's here. The bridegroom is here. Again, this is all taken from something that would have been part of their customs. Now think about it. Is that not what the Apostle Paul proclaimed to the church about Jesus' return one day, saying, can you read it with me? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what? A shout. A shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's going to be a loud command. And the bridegroom is here. Folks, I don't know about you, but the more I see going on in this world. Man, I, just, I sound like the guys that I knew when I was a kid growing up, you know, who were in their 80s and 90s, you know, looking forward to the resurrection, you know. Brother Lundy, Elder Lundy would always talk about the coming of Jesus, the coming of Jesus. And you're like, the coming of Jesus, you know. Now you get it. Because the older you become, the more fed up you become with the things of this world. Can I just put it that way, right? The more distasteful they become, the more you say, man, this place is messed up. As a kid, you got no idea. I mean, if things are good at home, if they are, hopefully, right? Things are good at school. Things are good. That's all you know. You don't listen to News Radio 88. Man, they're getting a lot of plugs today. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. But the more you see, the more you know. You say, oh, Lord, when? Lord, how long? Is this not why some of the final statements in the Bible, in Revelation 22, last chapter of the Bible, include words like, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come goes on to say words like, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. That's Jesus. Amen. And it closes that portion there saying, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. You see, being a follower of Jesus with the hope of heaven, that hope of eternity, knowing that you're going to go and be with him one day, whether it happens through just, you know, like the course of death here and now, or one day when Jesus comes and returns for us. Again, it's more than just about believing. It's more than just about a set of religious statements and truths. And, and yes, today as we use those, those terms like, like believing, absolutely, as we've been challenged, as we've been doing Bible study together, you know, whenever the Bible talks about faith, or believing, it's always talking about this faith or belief that, you know, is, is, it, it shows up in something that we do. It shows up in life change. It shows up in how we speak, how we act, and, and what we do with the time, treasure, and talents that God's given to us. Again, it's more than just about believing a set of doctrinal statements or truths and just having that head knowledge. It, it's about, folks, would you hear me? It's about a desire for the bridegroom. Somebody say desire. 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 I just got to ask you today, what are you really desiring? What are you desiring? Man, because what we see in the scriptures here is that these virgins, these bridesmaids, man, Jesus is painting the picture of what's going to be like. They're desiring the bridegroom. They're desiring for him to come. They want to be a part of this processional with the bridegroom to go and and snatch away and pick up his bride. And take that bride back to the father's house. They want to be a part of this processional with the bridegroom. This longing, this yearning for him. Folks, if that's not there, let's just be real. If you'd say, I've got a lot of desire in my life right now, but I've got to be honest with you. It's not for Jesus. It's not for Jesus. If that's not there, then maybe we have to ask ourselves why. Why? We don't want to fool ourselves. We don't want to fool ourselves. You might want to ask, what is it that you are desiring? What is it? Maybe things that are robbing, they're stealing the affections of your heart. What is it? Affections that are firstly 
and foremostly created and designed for, for your creator and savior. Affections that maybe we're filling up with other things. You know, my dad always had this one like cardinal rule. Maybe it would be if we were out at a restaurant or, or even at home. You know, I realize now as, as you're paying like grocery bills and all these things, right? I mean, you know, it's like crazy out there now. It's crazy with that. And now I know why my dad would a lot of times, a lot of parents are like, don't give your kids soda. But now I understand why my dad would buy soda for the house. Because it was a whole lot more, you know, a whole lot cheaper than letting us drink a ton of orange juice at the table. You know, he was just being, I think, in a way like frugal, you know, uh, in a sense. So anyway, you know, he would always say, though, he would say, don't fill up on soda before the meal. Right? Don't fill up on soda. Or maybe if we're out of restaurant, no, 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 don't fill up on bread. You know, don't fill up on the bread. Maybe you've said that to others. Maybe you've said that to yourself. I'm not going to let myself fill up on bread right now because I want to have, you know, a readiness for my meal. I want to be ready to eat my meal. Again, what is that I'm talking about? I'm talking about, you know, we begin to fill up our appetite with the wrong things. God's created an appetite within us, not just a physical appetite, but he's created that, that emotional, that spiritual appetite within us. He's created us with appetites, and we can end up filling up those appetites with the wrong things. That, guess what? In the end of the day, they still leave you empty. They still leave you hungry. You ever try to drink a lot of soda on a hot, hot day? Guess what the sugar does to you? Man, it creates more of a thirst within you. You just, you just like, ah, this is not quenching my thirst. It's not doing it. Again, affections that God has placed there that we end up trying to fill up with everything else. God's desire for us is that what? We would desire him. We would desire the bridegroom. Think about it, folks. If you're not living now with an anticipation and longing in your soul to be with Jesus, do you really think that's going to magically change one day? When Jesus says now, your time is up now. It, we're only fooling ourselves thinking it's going to all of a sudden radically change. Well, then I'm going to want to be with Jesus. Listen, I can't tell you for sure everyone who's going to be in God's kingdom one day and who's not going to be there, but I can tell you this. Nobody will be in God's kingdom who did not want to be there. Who did not long to be there. Who did not yearn to be there. Oh, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God said the psalmist. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul longs for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? I'm talking about a desire for the bridegroom, a desire for Jesus. Nobody's going to be with Jesus in his father's house who did not desire to be with him. Could you imagine a bridegroom, after all the preparations, after all the money spent, after all the work that he's done preparing a home, coming back for a bride who's like, oh, yeah, whatever. And she goes and does her own thing. She'd be like, that's crazy. If I were that groom, I'd be like, sister, hit the bricks, you know? Like, take a walk. No, 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 I'm coming for a bride that wants to be with me. Thank you, honey, for wanting to be with me, you know? <laughs> That's what it's about. Maybe today you'd be honest enough to admit, saying, I've actually lost my desire for God. You'd be honest enough to say, I've actually lost my desire for God. Or maybe you'd say, I don't even know if I've ever really had one. I'm thankful you're here. I'm thankful you're tuning in online. But maybe that would be the story of your life. I, I don't even know if I've ever even had one. It's okay. You're, you're, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. Maybe you'd ask God, though, today to help you. I just have to trust that if there's something there, there's becoming this realization that it's not there or it's grown cold. Man, praise God for that. Because that means he's at work, and you're aware of it. You're aware of it. Don't, don't think that, that now, like, all is lost, all is doomed. No, no, no. The awareness of it is God's grace in your life. That's his drawing of you. 
That's his love for you, that you're aware of it. Ask his help. Maybe ask him to forgive you for allowing other things to begin to try to fill the affections of your heart and life. Ask him to help you, to take some practical steps to maybe kindle or even rekindle your relationship with him, your desire for him, maybe to do things like make time to get alone with him. You know, if Kivian and I are just always apart, always apart, always apart, always apart, you tell me how much that, that relationship is being kindled. It's not. It's not. And so for some of you, that practical step of maybe kindling or rekindling that, that desire for Jesus is actually by faith stepping into that time of saying, God, I'm just going to make some time today to talk with you. And doing that day by day. I'm making time right now, not, just because, not because I feel it, but I'm doing it, God, because I know that this is what my relationship with you needs. I need this, Lord. I need this, right? Prayer is not so much about changing God, it's about changing us. Changing us. I need this, God. Maybe it's about turning off social media to read his word. Ouch, you know? Guess what that does? That begins to rekindle or kindle something within you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Right? In God's word, it begins to stir something up. Maybe to leave the comfort of your home, you know, uh, to get together with other believers more regularly. Maybe beyond Sunday morning. Or maybe for those of you watching online, praise God that you are, to actually take that step if you're able to, to leave your home to gather with other believers in person to worship together because why? what does that do? That begins to kindle and rekindle something that a lot of us know now what that's like after we weren't able to worship together for so long. We began to get used to that way of things, right? The relationship sort of began to coast. Hmm. For some of us, it might mean taking a walk out in nature and just pondering God's handiwork. These are ways that can kindle a desire for God, a fire within you. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's, it's playing music, or playing an instrument even, or singing a song. Not simply together when you're with everybody else, but on your own when it's just you and the Lord. And guess what that does? That begins to kindle something within you and that relationship, your desire for him. More and more, it grows. I'm talking about taking practical steps to kindle or rekindle that desire for the bridegroom. Desire for the bridegroom. Secondly, I want you to notice from our text, there's a delay that exposed the differences. Can you say that with me? There's a delay that exposed the differences. Again, notice that all ten of the virgins were very much the same in a lot of ways. Notice that all of them initially went out to meet the bridegroom. That was good, right? All of them had lamps or torches that were, uh, according to our text, already lit. So remember, it wasn't that they had no oil. They were already operating with oil. Sometimes we overread into some of the parts of a parable or a story Jesus tells, trying to pull, and I, I want to be careful of it, but I just want to put the facts out there. They already had oil working for them. Okay? We also see that all of them fell asleep waiting for the bridegroom. All of them did. But notice what it was that exposed the differences between the virgins. It was the bridegroom's delay. The fact that it took him a long time to arrive for his bride. In other words, nobody would have ever known who was prepared and who wasn't if things happened quickly. Right? If things, you know, happened with no delays. But how many of you know life does not happen without delays? And we spoke about that recently. It's full of delays, and God's word is clear. Jesus' return, the future coming of Messiah, of our Savior, will be delayed. Now, not according to God's plan and timetable, but according to ours. It will be a long time. Jesus couldn't have painted it more clearly in the various parables that he told. 
The guy was a long time going away. He went away on a faraway journey. He was delayed in coming back. Whatever it might be. In fact, that delay is all part of God's great rescue plan and weeding out process. You hear me? It's part of God's great rescue plan and weeding out process. On one hand, his delay is giving this world more time to turn to him. Peter writes all about this. He's not slow, like others count slowness or slackness, right? But he's patient with you, long-suffering, not wanting anyone to what? Perish. In other words, be lost for eternity without the hope of Jesus. But his delay is also what I would call this refining process by which people will expose their true colors. Would you hear me? A refining process by which people will expose their true colors. Please hear me, folks, including right in the church. True colors right in the church. And is that not what the delays, the waiting, the, the desert wanderings do? Right? They expose what's going on for real in our hearts. Think about it. The book of Exodus tells us, we rewind back all the way in the beginnings of the Bible, second book of the Bible, right? It tells us when the people saw that Moses, this man of God, okay, who had gone up the mountain, you know, to meet with God, when Moses was what? Delayed. Delayed. He was delayed to come down from the mountain the people now assembled around Aaron, Moses' brother, and said to him, let's worship the Lord, the one true God of Israel, and serve him only. Is that what it says? Yeah. No, that's not what it says. The delay, notice what happened now in the delay. They say, read it together with me. He said, they say to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. Just like us knuckleheads. Just like us. God's people. God's people. Just like us. Right? Moments before, oh, praise God. Yes, he's good. He's great. Oh, he's awesome. You know, this and that. But time and again, time and again, the delay comes. The people grew impatient, waiting for Moses, really, to come back. To come back. It was during that delay that what was in them, what was really in them, was exposed. Why? Because the delays of life function like a fire and crucible that bring to the surface the impurities of our hearts and lives. And nobody likes the delays. Nobody likes the fire. Nobody likes that crucible. But man, how necessary it is. And God is purifying his bride. God is purifying his bride. He's coming back for a spotless bride. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect one day before I, I leave this side of eternity, or you're going to be perfect one day. But he's refining us. He's working on us. And he's working on us. And he's working on us. And you and I are not simply to say, oh, God, you're holy, but you and I are called to be holy because he's holy. We're called to live out what he has put in us. To put in us. I just wonder, what is Jesus' delay exposing in the church today? Amen. What is Jesus' delay exposing in the church today? You know, as we pass churches even nearby here, and one of them, in fact, one day as we were passing with my boys, and, and they saw a symbol out there that was standing for what they understood in front of a church, that they understood that this was promoting, this was basically promoting uh, same-sex marriage, homosexual relationships. And, and they were confounded. Even my youngest, they were confounded. Because they knew this wasn't about Noah's 
ark and the rainbow and God's promise, they knew this symbol was being put up as a symbol to say, this is what we stand for as a church. As a church. What is Jesus' delay exposing in the church today? Folks, that's just one example. Don't think for a moment it's just about the homosexual community. It's very much about the heterosexual community as well, right within the church, doing things our own way, not God's. Not God's. What's Jesus' delay maybe exposing in your own heart and mine? The things that are coming to the surface that we're realizing, God, this isn't right. This is, I know it, God. I'm so thankful for his mercy, his grace, for his long suffering with me personally. I'm so thankful for when he brought me to that moment where I recognized this is sin in the eyes of God. But guess what? That's not just about an event 30 years ago. This needs to be an ongoing process. An ongoing process. God, search my heart, oh God. Show me, Lord. Show me those things, God, that are offensive in your eyes. What types of things are beginning to be exposed in the church that years ago, years ago, we would have thought in the church, no way. No way, it's not happening. But his delay, his delay continues to show these things for what they are. The delay of his coming is bringing these things to surface, things that otherwise would have been hidden, but now they are far from hidden. Far from hidden. Oh, to be like those five virgins or bridesmaids that Jesus speaks of who were prepared for the delay. They were prepared for the delay, and thus they persevered till the end. They persevered. I pray that we would be like two characters we read about earlier in the Gospels named Simeon and Anna. Two older people we read about in the Gospel of Luke who were in the temple. The Bible says that there, during this time of Mary and Joseph bringing little baby Jesus to the temple, that Simeon, this man, was there. And what was he doing he was waiting. He was waiting. He was looking forward with great anticipation. He was there waiting for the consolation of Israel. And, and, and Anna was there, and, and there as she will, she will speak about Jesus. She speaks to all those, the Bible will tell us, that were waiting for the redemption of Israel. Waiting. Praise God that there were those first century uh, Jewish men and women that knew, yes, Messiah had come. Yes, Messiah had come. Sure enough, God blessed them as they were waiting. God blessed them beyond their wildest dreams that they got to behold the face of their Messiah in the face of Yeshua. Jesus. Why? Because they were waiting. They were among those who were waiting. They, were, they didn't give up. They said, forget about this. Forget about it. You know, I'm out of here. No, they were waiting. They were waiting in spite of the delays, in spite of how many years and centuries and centuries it was taking. They were waiting. Oh, that we would be like Anna and Simeon, that we would wait in spite of the delay, that we too would behold his face one day. For we know when we see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is to behold him. You see, the church, the visible church, folks, it's full of people on the outside who look very much the same, very similar, quote the same verses, sing the same songs, say the same amens, might even have some of the great spiritual gifts and power operating in ways. Because a lot of times we're like, of course that person is a follower of Jesus. Of course they're going to be ready. Look at what he or she did. Look at that prophetic gift. Look at those miracles. Read Matthew 7. Lord, Lord. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and perform many miracles? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you who work lawlessness. 
He said they're like wolves dressed up in sheep's clothing. Again, there's many who look the same on the outside. It's all over the visible church, all around the globe. All around the globe. It's past, it's present, it will be future as well. And there's a problem. They look the same, but for so many, there's something critical that's missing. Now, I don't know, let me just say this, I don't know if they had it at one point and lost it, just keeping it real, or if they never had it. Would you hear me? I want you to investigate the parables of Jesus yourself, because I'm going to tell you this, what you're going to find in the parables of Jesus is that it could be either one, depending on what parable you're reading. They had something that they lost, or they never had it to begin with. But this we do know, when that day comes, when they're called to be ready, they're not. They're not. It's one of the saddest stories that Jesus paints for us. Those who live their whole lives, perhaps looking a certain part, talking a certain talk, but when judgment day comes, they're not ready. And Jesus makes it clear that for many it will be, listen folks, the delay of his coming or return that will eventually expose something that is off within them. Something that distinguishes them from those who endure to the end. His delay. You see, God's delay can either become your excuse to turn away from him or your opportunity to turn to him in faith. That's what his delay is about. Unfortunately, for half of the virgins or bridesmaids in our passage, it became the very thing that exposed their lack of readiness for the coming of the bridegroom. And that leads us to our final point, perhaps most riveting of all. And it's this, number three. Can you say it together with me? There's a door that is shut. There's a door that is shut. Notice again what Jesus said in our passage in Matthew 25. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came, also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Jesus wraps up saying, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, folks, for most of us, most of us, I'm going to say, we're not used to things being, uh, at least here now within this present culture here, um, what I would call event-oriented uh, rather than time-oriented. We're, we're used to things being time-oriented, you know, where we say, and we start promptly at 11, right? Got to be here early because we start promptly at 11, that's being what? Time-oriented. We're not used to things being event -oriented. Some of you came from countries or places where you, you're like, we were never time-oriented. We were always event-oriented, what I'm talking about. That again, we're used to things starting at a certain time, right? That gets dictated by our schedule, right? And, and when people run late, when the bride runs late, Everybody gets frustrated, especially the pastor, right? <laughs> Everybody, I mean, I have sat and waited and waited and waited, right? Uh, meanwhile, forget about the groom. I was the one waiting, right? But listen, some of you can relate to the culture that Jesus lived in. For them, things were and often still are in many cultures around the world that are probably represented right here in the room. They are much more about being event-oriented rather than time-oriented. In other words, the party, um, the celebration, it doesn't begin so much at a particular time. It begins when everybody's there, right? It begins, certain events begin when key individuals arrive, when key individuals are there. In the case of Matthew 25, it begins when who arrives? When the bridegroom arrives, which could be at any time. It's not time-oriented, it's event-oriented. 
oriented. I mean, could you imagine coming in today and you came and you're like, okay, I'm here at 11 o'clock, ready to go. And all of a sudden 11.05 goes by, 11.10, 11.15, and you're like, what's going on? How come they're not starting? 11.30 comes, 11.45, and you're like, what's, what's going on, you know? And, and um, you're waiting around and, well, guess what happens? You know, you start like, nothing's happening. It's 12 noon, 12 noon, and 12.15 comes, you're like, nothing's going on. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. You go. You're like, I'm done waiting around for this. And meanwhile, what happens? The church doesn't actually start until the pastor arrives. Some of you are like, yes, I came from a church like that. Now you can understand a little bit about what was happening in the picture that Jesus is painting in Matthew 25. You sort of get fed up with waiting around. Waiting around. Now don't miss it. Because although things were event-oriented, once those key parties arrived, you could and would most certainly be late if you weren't ready. So guess what? You had to always be ready. Be ready. Is that not Jesus' point? Is that not Jesus' point? Sure, you and I would love to be able to set our watches or even our Google calendars, okay? Exact date or time. What day of the uh, you, you know, month was it? What month? What, what year exactly? Did you say 88 reasons for Jesus coming in 1988? No, no, that's already passed. Uh, that one didn't work. 1914? Nope, that one didn't work either. We'd love to set our clocks or our Google calendars to the exact day and time that Jesus would return. Maybe so we can live however we want to live until just before he comes. You know what I'm talking about. But Jesus warns us, saying, it's not happening. No man knows the day nor the hour. Amen. It's not happening. Instead, you and I are called to be ready regardless of what day or hour the bridegroom arrives. And here's the thing. This is where it wraps up, folks. I would love to be able to tell you that when that day comes, when that moment comes, when your life here and now as you know it, comes to a close, or Jesus comes back for his bride, that that moment will be full of second chances. But I can't. I can't. I can argue till I'm blue in the face that according to the scriptures, God, he is, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. And we all said, Amen. Amen. But that does not take away from the fact that a loving and merciful Father, a long-suffering and gracious Savior, He still chooses moments where He draws a line in the sand and He says, enough. It's time. It's time. It doesn't take away from that. Yes, second chances or what God so beautifully and mercifully does now. But according to Jesus, it's not what he will do then. Not then. Not on that day. Some of us need to get a little uncomfortable in our seats right now. Folks, because I'd rather that you be uncomfortable right now and be ready for that day than to say, oh, that was such a comforting, pleasant word you spoke today, Pastor John. But guess what? It does you no good for eternity. No good. And I don't take my cues, I guess, from necessarily anybody else around me. I look to take my cues. I pray I take my cues not only from the Holy Spirit, but from the early church. From the early church. Oh, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Save yourselves. There will come a day, folks, when like the ark that we read about in Genesis that rescued Noah and his family and the animals from the flood, that the door will be shut. And don't forget who shut the door. It wasn't Noah. It wasn't his wife. Although she might have told him a few things to do around the ark, but that's not what was happening. It wasn't his wife. It wasn't his daughters or sons. Folks, 
it was the Lord. The Bible says the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut that door. My friends, he will shut that door one day. One day. Until that day, he has given us, in his grace and mercy, time. He's given us opportunity to say yes to him, to follow him, to trust in him, and to live for him all the days of our lives. I can't do it without him, can you? But how desperate I am, how desperate I am for his help every day, every moment. Would you stand across this room? Folks, many will plead one day, musicians, would you come? They'll plead, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And they'll say, truly, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. Folks, what about you? Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him in such a way that he knows you in that intimate way that Jesus spoke of? That you'd be able to say like, like, like those words from that beautiful uh, poetic book, their Song of Songs or Song of Solomon saying, I am my beloved's. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I'm talking about an intimate relationship with Almighty God that Jesus desires with you and me. He desires to be a husband to the husbandless, a father to the fatherless, a friend to the friendless. He desires for all of us to be that intimate person that he says, I stand at the door and knock. Now here's a door that you have the opportunity to open. Not that door one day, it's the door of your hearts and lives now. And he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone would open up, I will come in and dine and sup with him and he with me. In other words, it's this intimate fellowship and communion together, this relationship that God desires to enjoy with us. Folks, there's no time to waste. I visited a man this week that I had been seeing and, 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 and praying with and all through the, the years and this week as I saw him one day, by the next day I got the call saying he had passed away. It happened like that, like that. Others were speaking with me this past week even about a young person whose life was, whose life was snatched away recently like this like this. There's no time to waste. I'm not the keeper of your timetable. Only he is. We're called to be ready. Folks, let me put it this way before I just call you from the front to the back and all across this room to come. Kingdom readiness, I'll put it this way, means living every moment with a joyful expectation and faithful preparation for the bridegroom's arrival. Every moment. Every moment. There are many in the church who are sleeping. Many. But I hope you caught it in the word. Jesus describes that again, there's something that awakens them that awakens them. And I believe that with all my heart that God is not only doing an uprooting in his church right now, but he's also doing an awakening. He's doing an awakening. He's reviving those souls that have grown cold, that have grown weary, that have grown lukewarm. He's awakening. And I just got to believe that it's happening here, that it's happening in the churches all throughout Rockland County, all throughout New York, all throughout the United States, all around the globe. But that means nothing. That means nothing if you and I are not a part of that awakening. An awakening. As Kivian just begins to minister with the song, it's just a simple song that I put together because I want you to know how, how much this means to me. How much it means to me that you would just come front
to the back, all across this room, coming and declaring, I want to be ready. You say today, I'm not ready, but I want to be. I'm going to ask you just to begin to come right now. I'm not ready to meet Jesus. I'm not ready if something were to happen to me today or if Jesus were to return today. I'm not ready, but I want to be. I want to be. Maybe you'd come as a church today saying, Lord, we will be among those who are ready, who are ready. Would you just begin to come? Let's make it our anthem today. Thank you, hon. Let's come. Thank you, Lord. I want to be ready come on. for you. Come on. You need it today. You need it today. We need it, Lord. I want to be ready for you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do it. In the morning, in the evening, far away or soon, I want to be ready for you. Come on. Let's make it our prayer. Come on. I want to be ready for you. That's our prayer. That's our prayer, Lord. That's our prayer. I want to be ready for you, Lord. Hear our prayer. Hear our cry, Lord. In the morning, in the evening, far away or soon, I want to be ready for you. Thank you, Lord. In that moment. In that moment, when you call me, Jesus. I'll leave this world behind. So this moment, I surrender, tell him. I surrender. I give to you. In that moment, when you call me, I'll leave this world behind. So this moment, Come on, make it count. This moment, right now, right I here. Surrender. Make it count. Nobody can surrender for you. This is about you. Give to this is about you, you and the Lord. My life. Sing it out. Cause I want to be ready for you. Yes. Yes. Cause I want to be ready for you, Lord. In the morning, in the evening, far away or soon. I want to be ready for you. Now let me pray with you for a moment. Just musicians, keep playing. Thank you. If you need, in this moment right now, wherever you are, whether watching online, here at the front, in the back, wherever you are, you'd say, I, I, I realize I need God's forgiveness in my life. I need that turn today. I want to be ready, but I know that I'm not, or I'm not sure that I am. I, I want you to pray with me right now. There's no magic formula, but if you pray from your heart, turning to God today, turning from doing life your way, and turning to Jesus, and saying, yes, Jesus, I put my trust in you, and I want to follow you all the days of my life, God sees, He hears, He knows, He knows, He knows. I'm going to lead you in that prayer right now. I want you to pray it out with all your heart, if that's you. Just saying, dear God, right now in this moment, I turn to you. I admit to you, I can't do it without you. I'm a sinner. I've messed up. But thank you that you love me still. You love me so much that you sent Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross, for me, for being raised from the dead, for me, for one day coming back, for me. In this moment, I put my trust in you. I turn from myself and I turn to you. I invite you into my life. I ask you to rekindle a, fly, a flame, a fire, a desire 
in my heart for you. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. And in you, Jesus, I know that I am. I am a child of God with the hope of heaven. The world is behind me and the cross is before me. I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. I want to be ready for you. will remain open. You stay as long as you want to pray and talk to the Lord or talk to others today. But let me bless you before you go. Now to him who is coming with the clouds, whom every eye will see, even those who pierced him, to him be glory and honor, power and dominion now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you.